So, people. Can't even see what I'm doing, can you? Um, just going to fill a little quick time here. Do a little live chat ramble. Um, wisdoms from the crazy guy in the desert. Uh, so, I think the title is something like... Um, Paradigm shifting group think and uh, the eight intelligences. And so this is kind of just a, a bigger thought process thing. And this isn't really a, a, so much as a lesson about cannabis or a, it's a bigger life lesson thing that, that can be applied to all sorts of stuff. But I'm going to bring it back into cannabis and, and, and I'll do another one of these wisdom drops um, explaining a little tighter. But I've done some... Um, tried to communicate like in, in, in my uh, Instagram page and stuff in other places back when I was teaching in, in um, uh, probiotic farmers Alliance and stuff about um, utilizing proper words and proper context and such. Right. And so one of the huge things I was taught in college was, was about paradigms and paradigm shifting and group think. And we can apply this to all sorts of things. It, it, we see it right now in politics, this group think we're in a bubble and, you have these belief systems that so and so is evil and so and so is benevolent, right? And and so I don't want to make this political, but we all see this from our own perspectives, and we can see whether we're not part of either of those parties or that's like our core belief, right? We've got into this this intense blinders, and that's all we see, okay? And so this can happen in any sort of occupation we have in life, right? Um, like if you're a tradesman, right, and you're working on your job, your whole thing is your trade, your time schedule, in and out, everyone else is in your way, right? Instead of coordinating, working together, and, you know, you've got to have this, <clears throat> the contractor who's who's doing that, right? But, but like, <clears throat> the carpenter doesn't really understand the language of the electrician, do they? And so you've got to find this common communication where they, they are able to talk together. But when you're working in your niche, right, the guys who are moving wood around and, and shaving uh, fiber to make the frame, they've got this intense niche that they talk in, right? Um, that is their group think. That's their, that's their paradigm, okay? Um, it's a little bit different, for instance, from a furniture builder. Okay, they're going to have another niche and they're going to have another set of, of refined language that they utilize. And um, that, that uh, defines that their, their, their occupation, their niche, their specialty and, and such. Right. But but for the common consumer, we're buying cabinets. Right. And we're looking at a price tag on those cabinets. How long are they going to last? Where they're going to do the job for us that we need them to. So, like, the language of the cabinet maker is not necessarily relevant at all in the context to the person who owns a home and consumes those cabinets or table or um, the person who lives in the home. The context, uh, 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 the language of the carpenter is very much um, irrelevant, right? They're, they're got, is the house warm? Does it keep them dry? And is it beautiful to them, right? So they're looking, and the, the designer is going to have a whole another set of languages, right? Um, we can go back into the forest, right? And this is where my specialty came from, and understanding that that my professors were like literally having a doctorate degree, and they're out in the woods with a chainsaw, working with the ground guys because they wanted to understand the entire process from ground up, and not just. Uh, dictate prescriptions for the forest, for instance, right? And say, this is what you're going to do without even knowing if it's possible for somebody to do that, right? And they, they discover something, and I've found it out too, that that like um, there's a communication barrier when you have this laboratory mindset and language set, right? A very specific niche language that we talk in in a laboratory in a science setting and in specific science papers and such, right? And so... That kind of stuff is, um, it becomes a language barrier and then it creates, it, cre it creates this, this animosity, right? And, and so we can see this in our culture. There is, I'm going to let my cat out real quick. There's this major animosity that occurs between um, higher education folks and people who, who have a workaday job, right? And, and this is part of the basis of this, this communication barrier that occurs and, and not understanding how to really... Um, 
um, like like I, I, I've expressed this before when I talk about fire. Like to me, I look at fire and whether it's just a match or if it's a bonfire or if it's a mountainside burning. I don't I don't just see a flame. I see these chemical equations occurring when I see I see the wood literally pyrolysizing and turning from a solid into a gas and then combusting and oxidizing and, and, and becoming light and heat. And then there's all these vortices that are occurring. Right. And it's sucking in. Um, and again, I can, I, I used to be able to express this stuff directly off the top of my head in a mathematical equation that would just blow your fucking mind. I don't use that language anymore. I haven't used it in 25 years. It's not relevant. It's not relevant to anybody except for those in the laboratory, right? Or somebody who's like trying to model a computer program to dis, to predict what a fire is going to do. Okay. But if I was, for instance, fire engine captain with a bunch of people who just got out of high school and I'm trying to teach them about fire and I'm talking to that language, they think I'm an asshole. They think I'm a condescending prick for talking that way. Okay. And so if these different levels of, of usage and communication, uh, we've got to understand that, that we're, um, we're not all seeing the world the same way. And, and my thumbnail for this here is, is a painting I did in the field. And, and, and I used a couple of 120 year old rag dolls. One of them is from my family. One of them I picked up at a thrift shop. Right. So one's an heirloom. And, you know, you might just think there are a couple of rag dolls sitting in the field, but those are like valuable antiques. So perspective and such, right? And 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 then the oil painting itself, right? Um, that takes a lot of work to be able to sit there and do that. I want to show you guys something here. Um, so I've done quite a few oil paintings, and before I ever oil painted, I worked with um, I worked with black and white forever, right? And I did sculpting of things, and I did, but but this right here. This is, this is one of my very first outdoor oil paintings, okay? And I did this in a competition even. Okay, pretty profound. At the time, I thought I was an expert already, right? I've been working with other paints. I've been working with pastels and dry color, okay? So, but, but this painting here is, is not very profound, is it? But at the time, I thought I was the master of oil paints, and I submitted this in a competition. I actually sold the painting that day um, uh, in the competition. It was probably my third oil painting. This is maybe my second, okay? And, um, you know, what are we doing here? With this? I'm, I'm taking, you can see the basic colors across the bottom here, and I'm combining them to create all these different colors. I got two computers going here, so I want to... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the, at the chat at all today. I, I want to kind of roll through this thought process and, and, and teach this stuff. Now, after years and years and years, you know, I'm submitting stuff like this into my um, competitions. And I know the light in here and the camera sucks, right? But I'm sitting up in the field and painting this in a matter of two hours, right? Taking these colors, right? Now, there's different levels of expertise that I have in, in understanding this stuff. Before I ever even touched an oil painting, I had a full comprehension of the chemical composition of those pigments, right? I studied those pigments to and, and, and the combinations and the various pure forms, and there's there's what they call um, hues and, and professional-grade paints, and, and there's all these niches of the color itself, right? And so, so um, like, I had a complete understanding of that before I ever – touched oil paint, but, but again, was I a master oil painter? No. And I got to this point here and they're literally, the judges are using my paintings to teach a class after the competition to show form, depth and such like that. But, but at this point I'm starting to think, yeah, okay, um, maybe I'm not that good of an artist. People aren't buying my art, right? You know, here's, here's a whole nother, I got to a point where I can do these huge paintings. This is 18 by 24. It took me five hours standing there in the field. Okay. And am I a master of oil painting yet? I don't know. I've been working with, with paints for 45 years of different stuff. Okay. So um, there's other people that do completely different styles of oil painting. They do hyper-realism. They do um th there's people who like i'm just showing you my plain air work but but i also do studio work right where where people say this looks like a a complete um photograph right a hyper realism hyper photorealism okay so these are all different niches of just just oil painting right and and um there's there's the entire the entire range of of amateur to expert right we have masters we have teachers 
And not everyone's going to be able to speak that same language. Okay. Some people say Bob Ross is a joke, but Bob Ross is a master. That guy went through hell and he came back and gave so many people joy of painting in their homes. And some people look at those paintings and say, that painting sucks. The other people are going to say, man, I'll give you a thousand dollars for that same painting. Okay. So it's a perspective of people's position in life. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and so, you know, I showed you my own Dunner-Kruger effect that I experienced with working with just oil paints, right? So we can all think about someplace in our own life where we experience these things, okay? We all start out and move through these levels of understanding. And, and same thing, I went through the same process as, as a pro skier. The first time I showed up at a competition, I got so flipping humbled, but I knew I was the best before I got there, okay? Um, eventually, I was ranked in the top 14 of my specific niche style, of skiing, right? And um, the specific niche style of skiing that I did, I was actually inventing stuff because nobody else had ever done it before. Now, was I wrong in doing that? No, I was recognized by some of the greatest skiers in the world. Okay, I got commercials, I got into in, in, into um, uh, magazines and stuff and movies for doing these really um, unusual things, right? Um, I never competed in the Olympics. I never competed in in World Cup but I did compete in the highest levels of competition for the spec style that I was doing called Telemark, right? And did some pretty crazy things, got into where, and all this is, is me exploring the things that I like to do, right? Um, it's really, yesterday I stopped, I was cross country skiing and there were some people and there's a language barrier even. It turns out there's Spanish, but I don't have enough Spanish to say habla poquito español, pero no suficiente para teach somebody how to ski, tablas de nieve, okay? But I did my best to take these people who had never been on skis before and show them literally sidestepping up the hill and sliding back down the most simple, basic form without, with a major language barrier without language to try and show these people this is, this is the simplest way you're going to find joy in this and you can do it yourself. You can get there. You can, and we all progress through the next step, right? So, so literally, I was just trying to show them how to side slip down the hill. Okay, I'm not going to show them as an expert skier who figure out how to jump off 80 foot cliffs going backwards on only my toes attached to the ski. This person who has a language barrier doesn't speak English. So I only have a little bit of Spanish. I'm not going to tell them like, go jump off that cliff. Okay. Right. So um, these, these are different levels of communication, different contexts. And all this stuff, we can bring it right back into whatever it is that we're doing, whether it's we're baking, whether it's we're making cookies, whether if we're making medicines, we're making um, plants for people to grow, right? We've all got these different niches, right? And the commercial niche is not the same thing as the home hobbyist niche, okay? And, and so the language is not going to be the same thing, right? Um, we can find common language between these things, um, but we still need to communicate and not be aloof or upset other people and let everyone have the joy of what they're doing. Okay. So um, there's something you might not have heard of that I wanted to touch on. And, and I got this brought up on my phone. Um, I had it brought up on my phone. Where'd it go? Here we go. Gardner's theory of the intelligences. So uh, I just got introduced to this concept maybe a year, year and a half ago, but I've been really trying to bring it back up because this is, this is how the human race evolves, right? We, we all bounce off of each other. And, but if we're in this bubble and this group think, if we have this small niche thought um, and, and, and we don't see the perspective of somebody else, right? Think right now that whole, you know, one of the things I've been trying to get to you, the whole concept of the guy standing there pointing, it's a six, it's a nine, it's a six, it's a nine, it's a perspective. They're both right except for, well, somebody actually wrote it as a six or somebody actually wrote it as a nine, right? So you can have some confusion. No, from the perspective, they're both correct. And then we can look at the meme or mem, however you say it, of the like polygon with different colored lights hitting it and different shadows creating different forms of light and, and shapes, right? Every one of those is correct. All those perspectives are different and they're a different position in the time space of reality, okay? And, and so to dictate and say that the shadow of the purple square is the only truth when there's that light coming down here that makes a green triangle and right. So, so we really need to be able to go from the guy in the laboratory who's looking through a microscope and electrons and, and finding the chemot chemotography uh, or chemotypes 
down to the guy that's in his, um, uh, you know, I start talking about anything medicinal to new patients and stuff. They're just freaking lost, right? I got to ask them super basic questions, right? It's just, you can't just shove down the intense chemistry. My chemistry is only so advanced, right? Somebody who's in a university studying is going to have up here. The doctor is going to be up there, right? They're going to have a different set of knowledge, understanding, and communication capacity. And to me, I believe that it is the higher mind, the greater power has the responsibility to communicate to the lower uh, intellect or um, cognizance or um, knowledge set, right? It doesn't mean somebody's not intelligent, okay? So these different five, uh, the eight intelligences. So traditionally we've thought about is uh, we have an intelligent person that can like go through school and do, make it through school, right? And that was our basic thought of intelligence, right? But, but we all know that there's people who never went to school who are commanding a business, right? Who are making billions of dollars, right? Um, my sister didn't graduate high school and she's a 2% or her, her and her husband are both mega income earners and, and they're awesome people, right? So, so there's, um, we, we know that there's like, like, okay, I self-taught myself art. I didn't do, I swore off art teachers at the age of 14. I self-taught myself um, skiing, okay? Um, but we all know that like I, I took people out and there's people I could never teach how to ski. They don't have that physical um, capacity. Um, there are some people who are never going to get um, to figure out how colors blend, right? So, uh, but they might, they might be great at math. There was a guy I went to college with. He was graduating from Cal Poly as a computer engineer at the age of 21, I believe, right? This dude was just super intelligent with mathematics. He had absolutely no comprehension or ability to understand biology, right? And so I would tutor him on biology. This dude just blew me away. If we talked math, I'm dyslexic. Math is tough for me, right? Once I got my dyslexia figured out, I cranked that. So um, one of my greatest problems, though, is, is I've described earlier, is interpersonal communication and trying to really connect with people because I think these thoughts that are just like, what did he just say? And the existentialism and things like that, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, let me run through what these different intelligences are that he has um, laid out. So body kinesia, uh, kines, kinesia, kinesiology, the body movement, right? That's why I mentioned that with skiing or whatever, awkward. Uh, can you run? Are you... So that's a, a body intelligence and spatial um, with our environment. Um, I wonder if I can enlarge. Oh, I can. Musical is a discerning sounds, their pitch, tone, rhythm, and timbre, right? So I have, I have a little bit of musical intelligence. I thought I brought my flute up here. Anyhow, uh, you know, I, I can bang on a drum, but I ain't writing music. I can. I used to be able to read it. There's these different levels of. But so musical, it, these things kind of intertwine too. Musical is, is also a logical mathematical, but that's a whole separate intelligence in this. Uh, quantifying things, making hypotheses and proving them. Um, interpersonal, right? So this is, again, this is one of my biggest lacking points in the eight intelligences that define the entire intelligence. Um, sending people's, sensing people's feelings and motives, the interpersonal. Uh, intrapersonal. Understanding yourself, what you feel, and what you think. Linguistic, finding the right words to express what you mean. Spatial, visualizing the world in 3D, right? And this is the simplest ways that these are described. It gets totally expanded, and I encourage you to look them up and, and see the different discussions on them. Um, a naturalist, and understanding the living things and being able to read nature, Okay. Um, so, so just in our communication with the, with the cannabis plant, right? You can see how all of those things can cause a lot of confusion in, in our discussion where the majority of can, people who interact with the plant, like never at this point in time, they're going to go into dispensary, right? The majority of people who interact in the plant are never going to deal with a laboratory. The majority of people who deal with the plant are never going to, understand even the difference in THCV, CBG, CBN, okay? It would be nice if everyone did, right? So like, like think about, think about the levels of, of like just beer, you know? 
people there's people consume beer and it's like they order a beer and they get it like a plain American pilsner. Okay. Right. But, but, um, you know, the palette of when, when Sierra Nevada came out, right. There was an advertising campaign and, and Heineken and stuff. Ooh, skunky beer. Who wants skunky beer? I want this plain tasteless beer that we can produce commercially really cheap. Okay. We started learning slowly and people started getting educated. There's still a lot of people who will never touch a dark flavored beer, uh, microbrew, right? Um, so this is this is like what I'm talking about. We're, we're, we've got to apply more than just our focal point in our communication and understand that there's this bigger scope than our little bubble that we exist in, right? I try and explain how I lived under a rock in the desert doing mad science for 20 something years. I had scared to death. I never was, I never went on any uh, IC mag or, or, or any of the uh, forums, right? Scared to death for, for where I was living and such and to be able to even go online and, and search for online purchases of, and there's still people in the world like that who like, um, I get people asking me to, to please send them some seeds because they can't make a digital purchase or whatever because the country they live in, okay? And somehow stealthily get them some seeds that they can grow in the desert they live in, right? So that's a whole nother point of, of like industry and um, uh, research. It's all done in this little bubble of in the system. And in the system is a very teeny little portion of the, of the genomic a very little portion of the world right and in order for something to be studied it's got to be put into the system so why aren't they studying land races there's no really any land race in the system okay and as the system enlarges and we move forward we're going to have these larger views of of what and why and where and how um but but remembering that there is a bigger picture than our little focal point is huge right and so like i don't want to force people to do what i do I wouldn't expect most people would never do what I do, right? Like, would you wear something like this on your head? Would you wear something like this on your face, right? I am not anyone else, <laughs> right, right, right. So my 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 deal is what I do, and so so. Uh, but but there's a whole lot of other people who do their thing, right? And it's not academia, it's not industry, it's, um, for instance, heirloom tomatoes, right? Ooh. Um, gosh. The guy next to me at the, at the farmer's market would sell tomatoes out all freaking day long. The crappiest cardboard freaking hydro tomato that was a super poly hybrid that didn't have no flavor, but it was disease resistance and you could produce a ton of them in a greenhouse. And I sold heirloom organic. We call it probiotic the way I grew. It was a lot of work. And this guy would sit there and bark. I got the best tomatoes, world's famous best tomatoes. And his tomatoes taste like cardboard, right? But that he was selling and he sold, and he sold, and he sold, and he sold, and he sold out every single week. And he'd take away thousands and thousands of dollars from the farmer's market. I averaged 500 bucks a week, maybe. I would sell tomatoes from 6 to $12 a pound. I wouldn't say a thing. I'd offer people a sample, and they'd go, oh, crap, right? But why did people, very few people, buy $12 a pound for an heirloom tomato that doesn't produce commercially, Right. Um, I had a chef that literally took that tomato that she doesn't produce commercially. You'll never be able to get these things on a commercial scale because the, they're not these polyhybrids that are made for commercial production in the system. But they pay me $12 a pound, buy me out of those heirlooms in the early season and built a case to fly to New York City with these things to show them off at a loss of war international event. Right. That's not going to be something. It's a, it's, a not a, it's, a, it's a niche specialty thing. And there's a lot of room for that in the world. Um why isn't there land race in the commercial sector? Nobody wants to deal with those low yields, right? Nobody wants to deal with um, the, the, the variabilities and such or, or the long flowering periods, okay? So, but, and that's why we don't even have these things to look at. Um, I'm gonna show you here, uh, this here, here's some of the science I did. And back in the day when I was doing science, um, this is the dot matrix printer. Maybe I, maybe I had one of the first lasers prints for, for, for my, my term paper, right? But here, here we have, um, there's a histogram and a bell-shaped curve, right? And so now in the, in, in, and here, here's our, our commercial spaces. We have polyhybrids, right? There is no sativa or indica, but, but if we, if we like raise this curve out here, 
we have all these base genetics still. So if we if we like develop a new terminology to discuss the polyhybrids, it doesn't negate or remove the original terminology and taxonomy that applied to the um, to the to the previous communication uh, set. Um, you know, like, like, so, so when we, like, if I, if I bring up, I'm talking about type C, type C is a totally different context than chemotype, right? And a chemotype isn't going to replace taxonomy. Okay. And so the words were applied in taxonomy and then we get, there's these huge, huge debates as, and I'm, I'm kind of honing in on the word indica and sativa right now, right? Do these words applicable? Maybe not in a laboratory, right? When you're looking at, at chemovars, but 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 the common Joe ain't got a laboratory to look at a chemovar and understand if it's a type one, two, three, four, five, right? And all the sub language that goes on to that. Um, but we do have these taxonomic designations that originated with specific language that says this is why we named them that. And we can pick through and say, well, it also that word out of, in a different context means this, and it does. So let's talk about context of words. Two. Is that? Is it two little eyes? Is it two large eyes? Is it the letter two? Is it T W O? Is it T O? Is it T O O? Right? Is it deuce? Is it a pair? Is it a couple? Okay. So we have multiple words that can mean multiple things that all could mean the same thing when you say it if you don't understand the context. Right? So the context of the laboratory is not the context of the common user. The context of the master student researching a specific genome is not the same thing as somebody who is a closet grower trying to figure out which medicine is going to work for him for home production. Okay. And so when we come up with something and we say, hey, we've got this typing system and there's now indica and sativa are obsolete, that's it's like it's obsolete to you. It's not obsolete to everybody else who uses those words in the context in which they use them. Okay. Can we imagine, say, for instance, a welder saying that, that we have to utilize the language of um, the, ma uh, the math and chemistry of his welding rods in everyday language? Or an astrophysicist, you know, people, people hate Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? This is a common thing because he talks this, this language and he has this aloofness about it, right? And, and is it because he is in his niche and bubble away from the common man, or is it because the common man like didn't pay attention in basic studies in high school or a combination of both of those things? And so we have this wall of divide of communication and people hate scientists because they don't understand what Neil's saying. Okay, so, so we've really, you know, it's a great example is like one of the most difficult things that you can possibly comprehend is like thinking about form in the fourth dimension, right? And, and then Sagan does this thing where, where he takes somebody else's concept of flat world and he puts it in the simplest of languages. And you can look up this, this is archived in YouTube or whatever. You can, you can find Carl Sagan describing flat world in the most simplest of terms, right? And this guy's brain is freaking exponentially beyond me, right? I have an understanding. I, can, I, I know what a terrasect is. I, I, can, I can like show you, try and show you a solid form of a fourth dimension cube, right? But if, I, if I'm, I'm talking to somebody about this at a bar, they're just like, oh, dude, what? So really what I'm trying to explain here is, is that, like we really need to keep these things in context. We really need to um, uh, understand that there's different niches of communication and occupation of, of what we're all doing, okay? The, you know, back to art. The, the 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 majority there's an extremely teeny niche market for high end art right I almost stepped into it several times I, I almost sold paintings for twenty thousand I've gotten thirty six hundred dollars for a painting but most paintings most artists will never sell a painting for five thousand dollars the majority of paintings in the world by exponential increases is are are under two hundred dollars okay all the artwork in your walls. Think about how much artwork you have that's that's an original painting even, okay? And so there's this exclusive zone of high-end art that's selling for millions and millions and millions of dollars, and there's the rest of the world that has some art, right? And that art can be a centerfold from a pinup out of a out of a, your favorite ski magazine, right? And that's your art, okay? So, so it's not the same thing, and 
I don't know. I, I really wanted to explain this to people that, that really keeping the context of communication and understanding, having that full intelligence realm when we're looking at how, where we are talking to people above us or below us, asking people like, hey, what is the context you're using these words in? Not saying that word's irrelevant or you're using it wrong because that's condescending um, and it really doesn't look at the bigger picture of um, how the world works and who's in the conversation. Um, yeah, so, so just looking over your nomenclature you use is an intentional barrier to understanding and make the expert useful in many cases. So, and people say knowledge is power, right? And, and, and my change on that, that I come from um, just learning and like spending time talking with the Jesuits and stuff is knowledge is power only when you share it, right? And again, I believe it's, I, I had a painting I couldn't locate it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bull elk in the fog. And the bull elk thought I was a wolf and he stood guard over his harem as they moved out to a safe zone. Right. And, and so that's the painting, but, but it's, it's with great power comes responsibility. Right. And so again, I say that the person who has the greatest power of knowledge and understanding has the responsibility to communicate that in the form that ever the common person, the lay person. And I don't mean that in any derogatory term whatsoever. It's because we all have our expertise in what it is that we do, right? It's a completely different thing than what I do. And we can also find that there's lay people in forestry. I found this where there's people who had like a, a complete command of the scientific terminology, all of the Latin words that are applied to in the taxonomy as to why that may, and, and we can discuss this stuff. And it's like, wow, like, but, but you're an accountant. Okay, so it's rare. It's a rare bird day when you run into somebody that has that level of comprehension and, and understanding and whatnot. And I think Peter said it last night during the roundtable. It's like something about the conversation where 60% of the people only stand, understand 30% of what's being said. Okay, so yes, there's a thing where I, that like uh, wants to stir some people to like understand it better. But it also shuts a lot of people off and just like, I don't know what they're saying. That's all Greek, man. I'm going to go over here and, and talk my common language, right? Um, anyhow, so I, I think um, that's kind of the, the rough of the where I wanted to put um, in, in getting people to understand this. You know, I, I, I had this up. I want to read through. I put this on an Instagram. I got three computers going here now. Let's see. Um, love the camera chain angle on my eyes. That's the funniest stuff, so. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. I see Steelberg giving praises on the, the Purple Dragon monster. I really wish I had more of that seed. Peter might actually have a bag of loose seed with um, that I sent for a refill on one of those feminized that's just kind of hiding. Um, all right. I'm going to read off this other computer over here. So uh, let's see. I wrote an article or an outline for an article maybe three or four years ago describing a phenomenon that is a pet peeve of mine. The improper use of specific linguistics out of context of their intended linguistic niche. There are huge differences in the language of science and the common language. Taxonomy is a specific means of naming plants. The names reflect several possible denotations. Oh, I don't even know if I can... Uh, so, um, I'm sorry. I'm locked out of my, my Instagram again, and I was trying to get that to roll, and it just froze up on me. So you can go there. You're basically saying the, the same thing with a very specific um, in going through, like, forestry and taxonomy of the names of plants. And, 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 like, there's thousands of plants that are named after a person's name that was, like, the head of the explorer party going through the area when the botanists located – Name found, okay, this is part of this genus. This is a specific endemic, uh, and we're going to name it after the head of the party, right? So you have how many thousands of plants called Fremontii, right? And, and um, you know, we can look at, and I know this has been replaced, the California floral muns, right? But just if, if dichotomous keys are used to separate out your... Um, physical features of the plant to determine taxonomic designations, right? And so so the basic taxonomy of cannabis being cannabis sativa Linnaeus, right? He's the guy that named it, right? And then people have proposed taxonomic designations of indica, uh, ruderalis, and so there's the 
Cruft, uh, I'm sorry, without seeing it, I can't say it. Um, but there's there's a there's a Himalayanasis in Afghanica, right? So these are a couple of different, and they're based on the morphology, the, the, the plant's habit, the form, the physical forms we can see and discern, right? And so when we've probably hybridized all that stuff, it now kind of seems like it's irrelevant because it's sort of all mishmash, right? Okay, but, but again, I showed that bell-shaped curve. That's the industry has all that poly poly hybrids. And then out here, we still have those base genetics that so many people have in their reproduction collections. There are still land races in the field, whether they've been polluted or not genetically, they still have their main overriding dominant genetics in them. Okay, and we know that in some places that gets overridden severely, like they say in Jamaica did, because it's a small island. Other places it seems to get absorbed under the dominant structure of the genetics. Um, yeah, there's there's the burning part. Yeah, so so yes, in that context, in that niche, sativa and indica don't really have context. Is a chemical thing. Is you know, there's still there's still the taxonomic designation and variety designations, and they have structural form. Right and chemical, there was there were slight chemical variations that were quite obvious in the original designation of those terms. Right, it doesn't just because we've come up with a new system to delineate and further categorize does not replace. If we were to take further on the taxonomy, um, the 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 new taxonomy is being done on genomic level studies. Right, and so. Um, the if, if I understood what Dr. Schwabi said, she said that she saw over 300 different specifications under genomic separation. Okay, and that's going to get really, really, really confusing. But what are some of the taxonomic designations of, of sativa to begin with or, or um, indica? Right, sativa was originally named after the cultivated hemp plant that has the elongated stem, it has the stretched out inner nodes, it has the thinner leaves. Right. And there's all these different typing systems. We have the narrow leaf drug type, we have the narrow leaf on drug type, we have, and we have type one, two, three, four, five. All these typing things, none of them negate each other's usage depending on the context we're speaking in, right? And, and that's really, 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 really the gist of this entire blab I've been throwing down here, okay? It's just understanding that, that um, this interpersonal communication and all those intelligences has got to add up to to being able to communicate probably properly from the scientists who are figuring out the formulations that are going to be proper for each medical condition, like, so you can dose it right and keep it regulated, which is necessary for some people's conditions all the way down to where they're getting that from their dispensary or whatnot. And eventually someday medicine men like me are actually going to be able to have access to being able to do this in a laboratory. But until then, until everybody's got that access, we really need to have the full spectrum of communication available in context proper, right? So, um, yeah, no such thing as sativa or indica, right? <laughs> if you don't work with land race, you don't work with basic genetics, if you work with anything as a polyhybrid, yeah, there's, and, and uh, no, all the tissues aren't Kleenex either, no. Um, let's see, I'm going to look through, um, Yeah, cool. Appreciate y'all for stopping in. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm not telling you you have to use the language I'm talking about, but it makes life a lot easier when we understand how we all interact as human beings. Um, so I, I think there's some other shows coming up today on the Future Cannabis channel and um, simulcast over here on my own. I hope you all got uh, good information out of this as well. So, um, before I do shut off, anyone got a, a question down there? No one needs laboratory grade cannabis. Yeah, bring it back to nature. You know, if you can't just put a seed in the ground and let it grow, that's uh, which isn't commercially viable. It should be, and that's what one of the things I breed for is is like you should be able to like direct seed with a drill and produce all of the stuff we need, um, sunshine and rain. Cool. Happy day, everyone. Have a good Monday and um, peace out. Let's see, I go in stream, in stream, and, and.